Well, Christians the world over from different traditions and different places and throughout history have all agreed that we need Jesus. That's pretty common to the Christian faith. We, we need Jesus. We need his grace and his gifts. We need Jesus initially in our conversion and we need him day by day that we might be sanctified until one day he returns and we are made like him. And in every way, we need Jesus for our salvation and our growth and faith. The Apostle Paul in our passage this morning makes this clear. He, he calls us to unity, but also tells us that the source of this unity is Christ himself. That we are being grown up into him, but that he is also the source of this growth. And traditions the world over would believe this and confess it to be true. We need Jesus. The question, however, that begins to divide different traditions is where do we find him? If Jesus has ascended on high, which this passage tells us he has, how do we on earth access Jesus and the grace that he promises that we might grow. Well, that's what I want to consider this morning in Ephesians 4, as we consider this transition that we spoke of last week, where Paul begins to provide for us ethical instruction for Christian living. But in this passage also, he tells us how it is we might live up to the standards which he places before us. So the first thing that I want to see this morning is a call to unity. Well, last week we considered Paul's prayer for the church and Paul prays that God's presence would renovate its dwelling place and that this would happen individually, but it would also happen corporately that the Holy Spirit that dwells within us would make each one of us look more like Jesus, but also would make this whole church grow up into one body, to be unified, to be renovated after the image of the one who has saved us. Well, this is where we find him, Paul, beginning. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. Paul makes a transition here. He has spent three chapters speaking about God's work in Christ for the sake of the church. And now we see this shift to instruction. He is now calling us to do things in light of what he has taught us. But you'll notice that even as he transitions to this ethical instruction, he roots it in something. He roots it in our calling. Paul here is not urging us to earn our calling, but rather that we would live out the reality of what is already true of us. God has placed a call on our lives. If you'll remember, this is where the letter starts, isn't it? That God from Before the foundations of the earth called us, he elected us, he predestined us in his son. And now Paul is calling us to live a life according to that calling. That calling that is irrevocable, that has been placed on all who believe. And Paul is now calling us to look more like the name that has been given to us. What is often here when we transition to passages like this, that we begin to think very individualistically about these instructions. That as we receive these instructions, we tend to think that therefore us in isolation to one another. But I I want to notice just a couple of things. One, whenever you see the word you in the New Testament, it is generally plural. We don't get the advantage of seeing that because whether singular or plural, we just translate it as you. Well, this is where uh, the my people from Mississippi have a far, most, far more robust language than y'all 
in California because we have the word y'all. When we want to say you in the plural or the dual, we say y'all. If it's more than three people, we say all y'alls. Well, all y'alls is what Paul is saying here. He is calling not individuals, but the entire church together to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And you'll notice that the instructions themselves also have corporate and communal realities. That this call to worthiness is a call to unity. Look what he calls us to. Humility. Gentleness. Patience. All things that only get exercised in the context of being with others. You'll recall from much of chapter 2 and 3 that Paul has explained this great mystery that two very different peoples have now been made one. That there is no longer Jew or Gentile, but there is one new humanity in Christ. The barrier that once divided Jew and Gentile has now been washed away by the blood of Christ, and there is now one new mankind, one new household, one new temple, Paul says. Well, what happens when you bring people from very different traditions with very different political ideologies and very different dietary preferences together in one household? Some of you might say Thanksgiving. That's what that is. I mean, the reality here is Paul has talked about two extremely different groups of people now coming together. What is likely to happen when two very different groups of people come together? Well, there's likely to be division. There's likely to be disagreement. That these two groups have been made one objectively in Christ, but Paul is saying, now you need to start acting like it. You now need to start bearing with one another's differences in love. And that's going to take humility. That's going to take patience. That's going to take gentleness. And God's people for generations, the Jews, have this great pedigree. And now all of a sudden, five minutes ago, the Gentiles are invited into this family. What's their response? Well, it should be one of humility. The Gentiles who have now been added into this people have very different understandings of how to eat and how to worship. How are those, they supposed to interact with these Jews who have it all figured out? With patience, bearing with one another in love. The reality is, is as sinners with different opinions come together, there is so much opportunity for disagreement and so much opportunity for division. I mean, here among us, I know for the most part we agree on absolutely everything, but there might be a few issues that we could particularly fight about. We have different Opinions about education, different opinions about politics, different thoughts about how one should parent, and therefore different opinions about how other people's kids should act. What should we do about relationships to the outside world? How, How much should culture influence who we are? Should we cut it off at all? Different thoughts and approaches to the Christian life. I mean, we we thought that the pandemic was rife for division, and and that's true, but, but think about bringing together Jews and Gentiles to one dinner table and what that might require of the people sitting around that table. Paul is saying, you are objectively one, but now this has to, now renovation needs to happen. The Spirit needs to work in you 
that you might be able to interact with one another in humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, even in and perhaps especially in times of disagreement. He calls upon us to be eager to maintain the unity that Christ has already purchased. And he reminds us once again to act as we already are. Look what he says. He's like, he says, I'm calling you to act as those who have been baptized into one body, who are united already by one spirit, who have one blessed hope, who have one faith, who have one Lord, all adopted into one family with one God as our Father. Calling us to act according to this reality that is true of us. Now, don't, don't miss Paul's connections to the rest of Ephesians. We, we have a tendency to divorce these moral instructions as kind of disparately connected to what has come before. But, but as we have heard in the first three chapters that God has created a new mankind in Jesus and that he is uniting all things in heaven and on earth into one body, And in this passage, he tells us that as we grow in unity with one another, this is how this new creation grows. This is not disconnected from chapters 1 through 3. This is what new creation looks like as we become what is already said of us, that we might be united. Well, if this is true, then we'd hope that Jesus would not leave us alone to figure this out, that he would not leave us to our own devices to attain this union. Just as Jesus, just as all of his benefits come to us by gifts of grace, which Paul has been very clear to note, this cosmic call to union as a body also comes by God's gifts of grace. But the gifts that Paul mentions might be surprising to you. That's the next thing that I want to consider this morning as Christ's gifts of grace. Paul, in in verse 7, tells the reader that, that grace is given for the purpose of this unity as a body, and it is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And then Paul goes on to seemingly very strangely quote Psalm 68. Some commentators would say that he he misquotes Psalm 68. Paul says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Well, we read Psalm 68 this morning, and that's not exactly what it says. Um, The quote from Psalm 68 verse 18 says, says, and you ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train. So far, so good. But then he says that this one who ascended receives gifts, not gives gifts, but receives gifts. This is different than what Paul quotes. Paul tells us that the one who ascended is now the giver of gifts. What what exactly is going on here? Well, Paul does something that he he does in other places in the Bible. And and most commentators agree that what Paul is doing, quoting this one verse, is bringing in the theology of the whole psalm and giving it to us in one kind of quote. Um, We must remember that Paul's allowed to do these kind of things because he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we're just not going to question him. But if you look at what he says, it does really tell the story of the whole psalm. This psalm that speaks of Yahweh, the divine warrior, that wins a great victory. He receives the spoils of that victory, and then he gives them to his people. This is what Psalm 68 tells us about. Jesus, according to Paul, is this divine warrior. Jesus is Yahweh. And Jesus has ascended to his victorious throne on high. Paul has already told us where that is, at the Father's right hand. And he now delivers gifts to his people. 
Now, Paul also wants to remind us by way of a parenthetical that that he who ascended first descended into the lower regions. If you look at commentaries, you will find all sorts of opinions about what this means. But I think the best way to understand it is that this is talking about Christ's death and burial, that he has descended into the place of the dead, that Christ's path to ascent first starts with his death. And this is very common to Paul's theology elsewhere. Philippians 2 is a great example of this. But however you take it, this ascension creates for us a problem. It creates some level of separation between us, Jesus, and his graces. The problem that we started with in our sermon this morning. We we need grace. We need Christ's grace to bring about the union of heaven and earth that is being realized in the church. Paul will tell us once again at the end of the passage that it is in this head that we have any ability to grow up at all. We need Jesus, not only for our conversion, but for our constant growth. Well, according to Paul, we access him and his renovative power through the gifts that he gives. Now, it is true that all Christians are given gifts for the sake of the church, spiritual gifts in which they exercise for the church's benefit. We find different lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament, and these are good and godly things, but it's not what Paul is talking about here. You'll notice, if you have a Bible in front of you, take a look at this. If you look at verse 9, it is likely that there is um, parentheses around verses 9 and 10, and rightly so. Paul takes a bit of a scenic path to teach us some theology that is connected to this idea of ascension and dissension. But but for a moment, I'd like to take the direct path from verses 7 and then skipping that parentheses. Read with me beginning in verse 7. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. The theme here is gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now to verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. The gifts that Paul has in focus here are men, the officers of the church. He lists those officers first that he explained in chapter 2 were those that laid a foundation, the apostles and the prophets. And then he lists those officers that continue to proclaim the content of this foundation, evangelists, shepherds, or you could translate that pastors, and teachers. Now, there's a fair amount of debate on who exactly these officers are and what exactly their unique roles are, but I want to go to what most people understand is common in this passage, that in the case of all of these offices, the common thread is that they are those ordained for the ministry of the word. They're preachers, teachers, proclaimers of God's word in all cases. That these are the officers that are to preach and teach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what Paul has in view here. And it is that ministry of the word, according to Paul, that brings about the unity that he is calling for. We continue into verse 12. You'll notice, depending on what translation you're reading from, they can look a bit different. I I do think that the older translations, including the King James, gets this right. It, It renders it like this, that these offices are given, one, for the perfecting of the saints, two, for the work of ministry, and three, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Three tasks that Paul attributes to the officers of the church. 
If you're reading from the ESV, it does arrange it a bit differently. It makes it sound as if the officers equip saints that the saints might then go and do the ministry. But in context and in the Greek, this translation, I don't think, makes a whole lot of sense. Because what we see here is that these officers and the ministry they do is the ministry of the word. Throughout the New Testament, we see that there is a unique call to those who are to go out and to preach. Certainly, everyone is gifted in ways that bring unity to the body. But there's a uniqueness to those who are given to proclaim God's word from his pulpits. We see this as the New Testament pattern, don't we? The apostles and the Great Commission are given the instruction to go and make disciples. How? By teaching and preaching and by baptizing. Word and sacrament. And then they go on to raise up pastors and and shepherds in congregations to do the same, instructing them with words like preach, in season and out of season. They call these men to focus their efforts on the public reading and exhortation of God's word. And as we see this word go out, especially in the book of Acts, we see that it is this word that gathers the church, but it is also this word that perfects and grows the church. Calvin says it this way, according to the command of Christ, no real union or perfection is attained but by the outward preaching of the word. He goes on, we must allow ourselves to be ruled and taught by men. He says, those who neglect this instrument and hope to become perfect in Christ on their own are in utter madness. Perhaps this is a appropriate time to recognize that this week we have once again heard about a minister fall because of moral failure. Uh, And it is a heartbreaking thing, someone who is quite renowned in uh, in public circles, especially in the reform world. And it is heartbreaking to witness. It brings shame upon Christ's church. Uh, It does untold damage to sheep. At the same time, it is interesting that in the book of Acts, as Paul is teaching the elders of this church in Ephesus, he says that this type of thing is going to happen. That dangerous wolves will come up and it will be some of you. That these occurrences of ministers falling is no surprise to Jesus. And apparently, he still chooses and ordains that sinners be his mouthpiece. Because it is not the men in and of themselves that is of import here, but the word of Christ that they carry and the church of Christ that they represent. Men will come and go, but this word is what remains. And that's what Paul focuses on here. It is this word of Christ. And through this word proclaimed that we receive the gifts of grace needed to grow in union as a church. God does not demand and then leave us alone to fulfill. He first establishes our union. One body by one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And as he calls us to walk in a manner worthy of this call, he gives us the grace to attain it by way of the ministry of the church. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about the ordinary means of grace. Through the preaching of God's word, we are grown into what Christ desires of us. And as we see, finally, we see that this growth takes a lifetime. That's what I want to conclude with this morning, lifelong growth. You'll notice the final goal of this 
ministry of the church in verse 13. When does it end? Well, Paul says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. It will end when we all attain mature manhood. That is, when we attain the stature of the fullness of Christ. When we grow up into him who is our head. That is to say, this ministry will continue until we all, as individuals, become like Jesus. And we all, as a church, look like Jesus. How long will that be? Until we see him and are made like him. We tend to often think of the church as a personal trainer that gets us strong enough to then go out and figure it out on our own. But the truth is, is this is the home in which God nourishes and brings up his people. The, to the history of the church, the historians have called, or, or, or pastors and elders have called the church a mother, a nursing mother. Calvin says this, the church into whose bosom God is pleased to gather his children, not only that they may be nourished by her help and ministry as long as they are infants, but also that they may be guided by her motherly care until they reach maturity and at last reach the goal of faith. That goal being to be glorified, to see Jesus. This is to say that we never grow out of our need for the church. And that might be depressing, but it's what God tells us is going to be the case. It will take our whole lifetime to grow into this maturity, and not only our lifetime, but the whole history of the church from Christ's establishment to his return will be the process of this church growing in union through the ordinary means of grace, where we come and hear the good news of Christ's love for us, where that love transforms us, where we hear of his fatherly instructions for our lives and we learn that his wisdom is greater than the world's wisdom, where his people gather around one table where he promises to give us nothing less than his very son and his benefits that we might grow and mature as his people. Where do we find Jesus? We find him here in the place that he has ordained. Last year, Southern California native Edwin Castro won over $2 billion in the California State Lottery quite something. And so clearly, if you are broke, the thing to do is play the lottery. By your giggles, I can tell that we mostly agree that that would be foolish math. If you need money, you go to a place where it's promised to be given out, i.e., you find a job. <laughs> You go somewhere where they promise to give you money. And if we need Jesus, we go to the place where he has promised to be present. And we go week after week after week. We find him here where his body gathers and where he promises to be. For he promises that where his word is preached, he will be heard. He promises that as bread and wine are given out and received in faith, we will have communion with him. And through those gifts and through this church, God is uniting all things in heaven and on earth. And he is doing it through the means in which he has promised to bring it about. And they might seem foolish, but he gets to make that decision. And don't forget that he started this whole project of taking over the world by way of a cross. 
And that same God uses what seems to be foolish to continue to establish and to grow his kingdom. When your pastors and elders urge you to attend church faithfully, it is not out of a spirit of legalism, but because we believe this to be true. That we believe that right here is where Jesus promises to transform us as individuals, but also as this new humanity. Here where we are safe in the ark of the church, where we find safety from the winds of false doctrine that are all around us. Where we find safety from worldly cunning and craftiness, as Paul says where we are learning to be what is already true of us, united as one body with Christ Jesus as our loving head. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of this calling, but I also urge you to not try to do it alone, but to allow the gifts of grace from Christ himself, those gifts that he has instituted, to transform, and to bring about unity in our body. May he grant that through these means of grace that we might have eagerness to maintain the unity that he has already secured for us in the blood of his precious precious son. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let's pray.